Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And we were just talking off mic and you wanted people to know that you've got a cold. So. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, so forgive me if I have a coughing fit in the middle of our conversation. Okay, we will. We will forgive you that. And uh, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Uh, we're going to be discussing your book about social anxiety. And uh, it's only recently come out. I think you said you told me before the show, what, two weeks? That's right. Exactly. My book's birthday was two weeks ago. Uh-huh. Okay. Your book's birthday. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, wish I, I wish it had been out sooner because uh, sometime back, a listener contacted me asking for a good book on anxiety. Now, I don't know if this listener was suffering from social anxiety, but in the book, you make it clear that it's pro probably one of the most uh, common kinds of anxieties. Yes, it is the third that, most common be? psychiatric disorder after depression and alcoholism. So it's right up there, as I say, with the big boys. Yeah, really, that's kind of startling. I, I would not have guessed that. We all have heard that uh, the, the uh, fright of public speaking Mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, the, one of the largest fears. But to put it up there with other major psychiatric disorders uh, never occurred to me. Sure. I mean, well, uh, fear of public speaking is definitely a, a subset of social anxiety. It's a yeah. performance. It's, you know, be, it's the potential to be judged and evaluated. So, yeah, that definitely falls within the realm of social anxiety. Yeah. Well, if that uh, listener ever contacts me again, this will be, your book will be the one that I'll recommend. Fantastic. And, uh, That's yeah, awesome. Because it's uh, uh, very clear, uh, well-written, good guidelines, and... Um, and self-disclosing because uh, uh, I believe you suffered from social anxiety as you sure. were coming up. <clears throat> yeah, I, um, I definitely uh, was uh, on the socially anxious side. And um, as I say, you know, several decades and a PhD in clinical psychology later, that um, <laughs> is, is, is not the case anymore. But I, you know, I still have my moments. Uh, you know, I, I actually don't really like to be on camera, so so I'm I'm uh, doing an exposure right now. Well, um, thank you so sure, much. Sure, absolutely. Really no, I, it's it's funny because as as the book has uh, as I've done interviews for the book, I've been on camera more and more, and it's getting easier and easier. So I'm happy to uh, practice what I preach and to yeah. reap the benefits thereof. Um, you know, but I, you know, I, I shy away from conflict. I still get a little weirdly formal around authority figures, but in general, um, social anxiety doesn't own me anymore. I can do what I want to do rather than letting fear choose for me. And so for that, I am thankful, but I, I make use of the tools in the book you know, myself. So yeah, I, I'm not just the author, I'm also a client. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I always appreciate that. I think when the author is self-disclosing, and I, you know, I think a lot of us in this field kind of know that secretly, when people write a book, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's about them to quite an extent. Research is me, search, right? So yeah. there you go. There you go. That's a great saying, and uh, I recognize myself in it. Um, sometimes I will cross to the other side of the street. You know, I'll see somebody, sure, that, sure. maybe a, a colleague, you know, that uh, I don't really want to interact with. Right, right. <laughs> or act like I don't see them. And, yes, and, yes, uh, of and course. I realize there's a real kind of social avoidance there of feeling uh, awkward, uh, that I don't know what to say, and uh, and sometimes have trouble with small talk. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're absolutely not alone. Many, many yeah. people are in the same boat. Most people are in the same boat. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's comforting to know. Yes. And, um, and, and of course, I, I knew that you suffered from social anxiety because I read it in the book. I read it sure. in your prologue, which was uh, delightful because in it, in the prologue, there's this uh, wonderful device that you use, a rhetorical device, if you will, where you give a case example of Mo. Mm, mm -hmm, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful story about Mo and, and the social anxiety that Mo suffers from. And it's not until you get to the end of the prologue that there's sort of the surprise punch of the end of the story, if you will. Yes. I'm not going to give it away. No, here. I was going to say, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't spoil it. I won't, I won't do a spoiler. Yeah. 
it, it ends people up. People will have to buy the a, book a for well that reason. If, yes. Even if you don't suffer from social anxiety, you should buy the book for that. <laughs> just, just to find out who that is, right? Yeah. Right, our our yeah. mystery guest, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was delightful. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. So, how do you define social anxiety? Sure. So, um, so social anxiety is so it's commonly thought of being a fear of people, or sometimes it's thought of being a fear of embarrassment. But really, embarrassment is is the consequence of our fear coming true. And so, truly, what it is, it's the perception, and I, I emphasis on perception, that there's something embarrassing or deficient about us that unless we work hard to conceal, to hide it, it will be revealed and as a result will be judged or rejected. So I, a, a nice analogy I like to use is we can, we can all relate to the experience of looking in the mirror and finding some kind of flaw. Like maybe we're having a bad hair day, maybe we have a pimple, maybe we think our butt looks big you know, in these pants. And, and that, that sense of wanting to to conceal that, to, you know, to throw on some tinted moisturizer, to put on a hat, to change our pants, um, is, is that self-consciousness is the same self-consciousness co self -consciousness we would feel um, in an in instance of social anxiety, except in social anxiety, instead of for the external self, it's for the internal self. It's for our personality, our character, our social skills, who we are as a person. And so mm -hmm. I think most people can relate to feeling self-conscious externally. And, and actually most people can also feel, uh, can relate to feeling self-conscious internally. That's, that's that feeling, that urge to conceal is, the, is the, the red flag. So do you have any numbers on, and I didn't warn you that I might ask you. No, it's fine. I have numbers, absolutely. <laughs> Any sure. numbers on how common social anxiety is? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's quite common. Um, so the, the everyday way of saying socially anxious is to say shy. That's how you know, our, 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 we talk about it in just kind of everyday life, not clinical language. And yeah. so if you ask people if they're shy, 40% of people will say yes, which already is a lot of people. That's almost half. However, if you change that question and say, have you ever been shy? Were you shy as a child? Were you awkward as a teenager? 80% of people will say yes. So that's the vast majority of people who can relate somehow to feeling shy or socially anxious. Now, if we, um, if we draw a line where it crosses over into a disorder, that is to say where it becomes distressing or impairing, then 13% of individuals at some point in their life will qualify as having social anxiety disorder, which I differentiate in the book as, I call it capital S social anxiety. Um, and so you know, 13% is, is a lot of people, that's more than one in 10. And uh, so while, while everybody can relate, everybody has their insecurities, you know, there are 13% of us for whom social anxiety does get in the way of living life. Um, however, no matter where you fall on the continuum, you know, I have good news, there is hope, and there are some really great ways to, to stop you know, letting fear get the, the best of us, you know, to build confidence and to be who you are without fear, which is what I call your true self. So, so and we can talk about the different ways to Sure, to we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. One of the things I'm, I'm struck by though, is uh, you said, if you ask people if they have ever suffered from um, implies that maybe maybe a substantial number of people just grow out of it. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, I mean, because all anxieties are maintained by avoidance, by um, either overt avoidance. So, in, in the case of social anxiety, you know, not showing up, uh, you know, staying home, turning down the invitation, not returning the text or the email. Um, but they, it can, uh, avoidance can also be covert. So showing up, but, you know, let's take the example of a party. So showing up, but spending all our time in the corner scrolling through our phone or just kind of hovering by the, by the buffet, you know, mainlining chips and salsa or petting Ouch. the host's cat. You know? so, <laughs> <is> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, so, so avoidance, avoidance maintains anxiety. If we have a genetic tendency to be anxious, then uh, avoidance is the miracle grow for that for that genetic tendency to to 
turn into. Going back to the party, I think one of the examples you gave in the book was petting the petting the dog. Yeah, <laughs> if there's right, a dog right. there, absolutely. And I certainly identify with that. Or talk. Oh, sure, to I've done that. Child, you know, and uh -huh. being able, <laughs> feeling comfortable, you know, with the child. Right, right, more absolutely. More than the adults. There's, there's less yeah. at stake somehow. So yeah. yes, anyway. So, uh, but um, yeah. So avoidance maintains the. Um, anxiety. I don't know if I answered your question, so ask, I, ask me that again. I don't again. remember if there was That's a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is how this will go, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so is uh, social anxiety on the rise? Is it going down wow. as we all become more, uh, more whatever, more sophisticated, etc.? What's the the status of it? Sure. <laughs> Excuse me. So. Um, so social anxiety is definitely on the rise. And I think that's for several reasons. So one is, is actually good news. I think uh, mental, um, the, the stigma against mental illness is, is slowly, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> is slowly declining. And, uh, and that's, that's certainly good news because um, the being able to talk openly about struggles is, uh, is, is just a wonderful way to, uh, to you know, connect with others and feel understood. Well, at the same time, I think social anxiety is, uh, is increasing because, in a large part, because of technology. And I can talk more about, about that if, if, if you'd like. Yeah, but, I'm very interested in technology as it happens. Uh, kind of, uh, here we are talking <laughs> in, in a technological uh, medium. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think so, so <laughs> excuse me. What technology does is it's um, it's designed to make our lives more convenient, um, but at the same time, it often allows us to avoid people. And so, for instance, I was in New York uh, a few weeks ago, and I saw a sign on the subway that said, "I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like uh, everything." It was a food delivery service, and it said like everything you love about eating, including everything you love about avoiding people, and. Uh, and so it just, um, wow. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's blatant. <laughs> it's very blatant. And so and, and, like, there was another one that says like, you know, over 8 million people living in New York City and we help you avoid them all. So, <laughs> 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 so technology is definitely a paradox because it, you know, it certainly allows us to connect like never before, but it also allows us to avoid each other. And you know, there you know, people can be annoying and prejudiced and unpredictable. But you know, people are also awesome and hilarious and caring and wonderful. And so we, when we avoid something, including people, it gets built up in our mind as something big and scary. And so, for instance, like I, I know at least for me, um, when I procrastinate about something and then finally get around to doing it, I often think, really, was that it? That took like five minutes. And so, but the buildup gets like gets so big because of my own avoidance that it, it becomes almost insurmountable. And when I actually do it, it's not that bad. So I think the same thing happens when we avoid people. It gets built up in our minds as as that people are you know unpredictable and uncontrollable and cause cause emotions like self consciousness or boredom or anxiety. But then when we actually deal with them, people often are are usually pleasantly surprised and think, you know, that wasn't that bad, or, oh, that was actually lovely to connect in person. So, um, so that's, so technology in its, in allowing us to avoid people, I think, makes us more anxious. Um, it's also, you know, you, I think- You were talking about procrastination, and I really, uh, it took me pretty far along in my educational journey to a PhD to finally, come to, to finally realize that the anxiety was much worse than just doing it. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> do oh it my goodness. so you don't have to feel yeah. anxious all yeah, yeah, the time. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. No, and then I talk to my clients about that all the time. I, I, I like it, well, because I, I, I talk to them in terms of social anxiety about building confidence, because so many of them say, you know, I wish I could just retreat from the world and like work on myself and make myself confident and then reemerge and, and, and be ready to, to live my life. And I say, that's awesome. However, let's do that backwards. Let's do that in the other way. Let's have you live your life in order to build confidence and to sell this idea to them. I often talk about um, the, the motivation and action connection and saying, you know, like we often think that we have to 
feel like doing something before we do it. We have to feel like going to the gym before we lace up our shoes. We have to feel inspired before we sit down and write. And that actually those things are backwards. And if we, if we just go to the gym, oftentimes we're glad we went. It's what, like once we get there, we're like, oh, we get into the rhythm. It's not so bad. If we sit down and just start typing, then inspiration strikes. And so, and so I talk about confidence in the same way. And that, that usually helps that, that land. Um, yeah, people yeah, that. yeah. So we were talking earlier about social avoidance being mm -hmm. a, a big component of this. And uh, I, I think you said that social anxiety is especially on the rise among adolescents and millennials. So. Yes, yes. And I think this, this I think, um, goes with technology as well, because um, technology allows us to, so, it, okay, so let me back up. So anxiety is driven by uncertainty. And technology has reduced uncertainty um, in a world where now dealing with uncertainty is a necessary skill. So, for example, like technology allows us to control our world and our consumption really like never before. Like we can stay immersed in this world of our own choosing. So uh, when, when we're, if we need to know where to go, we ask Google Maps. We can preview menus before we get to the restaurant. We can see who's on the guest list by checking the Evite list. We mm -hmm. can... You know, there's so many things that we can we can reduce uncertainty on a on a small like lower level um, very very easily, but at the same time the world has gotten more uncertain for the big things so things like a career or finding a partner so you know we're we're in the gig economy now it's very unusual for people to have a 30 year career like my father did it's more likely that people will switch jobs every few years or freelance or be self-employed and all of that is very uncertain. Same thing with how we date now. Now that we have online dating and services like, like Tinder, the, the number of options have multiplied exponentially. And so there's this uncertainty of, am I really with the right person or is a better match just a swipe away? And so I think for, for the big things in life, uncertainty has greatly expanded but we're not getting the practice of dealing with uncertainty, even at these very low, like low level things. So, so that leaves us with less practice under our belt and less experience, again, knowing that the worst case scenario is probably not gonna happen. And also we don't know, we don't have the evidence that we can handle it, that we can cope with uncertainty or cope with emotions like boredom or self-consciousness or, or whatnot. And by avoiding those, we um we again anxiety gets maintained so i think so, i think so that's talk about happens. young people and what it's like for them these days you know the the junior high student or the high school student sure yeah well i think um that that i mean so i'll i'll, I'll be i'll disclose so i'm 40 um and so like i i remember when like email was new like i you know i grew up without the internet but i in my clinic um, because I, I work at a clinic that's affiliated with the university, I get um, a lot of people in kind of a 18 to 25 year old range. And they're actually my favorite um, uh, people to, to work with because they, they're, they have so much energy and um, just this, a fresh perspective. But at the same time, I think, especially growing up with social media um, is, is, is a particular challenge because social media is, social judgment in public 24 seven, like your, your followers, your likes, uh, the comments are all public. All your friends can, can see what's, what's happening if you're being approved of or, or sort of rejected. And that can be a really hard place to grow up. Oh, that feels so dangerous, you know, it just when you it talk does. about it to, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I was talking to a, a friend who has a daughter in, college and is trying to get into a sorority and she said that if your Instagram posts don't get at least 200 likes you're essentially ostracized and so that would it seemed very extreme and I, I, I personally can't relate to it but it, it sounds like it can be very very vicious so I, I can um, believe that because oh, yeah. when, I, when I was uh, <clears throat> in college uh, there was the fraternity system was very strong mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't particularly interested in joining a fraternity, but one of my friends who was very keen to, he 
told me the story of going to this one fraternity where one of the brothers took him to his closet and opened the door and he said, see all those ties? And the closet, like a ton of ties, right? Uh-huh. If you don't have that many ties, this is not the fraternity for you. Hmm. Well, hmm. I thought that was just mind-blowingly disgusting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. But, but the Better example you gave time. about Instagram getting yeah. into a sorority, yeah, I could see that that's just the same thing played out mm -hmm. in a different way. I agree, I agree. And I think something else that's happening is that um, that young, I sound like a curmudgeon, young people today, that, that young people today. Um, so because they grow up with texting and emailing and comments um, as, a, as a, a, a form of communication, they get less practice actually talking in real time. Like with typing, with texting and comments and emails, you have time to compose and edit and perfect but speaking face to face is different. So in real time, you don't have time to compose or edit. And so this, this is additive. Like it's, if you have, if you're having hundreds of conversations a day, but many of them are over text, there's a lack of experience in speaking to someone's face that builds up. And so again, the same thing, you have less experience to draw on. And so things remain uncertain. You don't have the experience to know what's gonna happen. Therefore you assume it's gonna go badly plus there's less faith in your own ability. So again, then those are the things that drive anxiety. So yeah. I think the, the texting culture, while, you know, while, while I think it can be certainly helpful, I think um, you don't have to sit by the phone to wait you know, for your friend to call anymore. Like it's, it's, it, there are definitely advantages, but, um, but I think that if it cuts into practicing it, talking face to face, it can definitely uh, be a detriment. Yeah, I to some extent I've gotten sucked into that texting thing. Oh sure, I'm, I use my smartphone as much as anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely easy. It's you know it's very quick, mm -hmm. and, um, and but your brain is already formed. I think for yeah. you know for teenagers for whom you know they're still they're still growing and their brains are still developing. Um, we we don't know if that's uh, you know some some authors would certainly have us believe that it's a horrible thing and uh, yeah. that the generation is doomed and then you know there are those who say that this is just a different way of communicating and that it's you know things will shake out in the end so I think we we don't really know but um, but there is definitely a difference and I can yeah. see how that drives anxiety. Yeah, I remember when I first ha heard about texting, it was a. Uh... It's kind of mysterious. Why would people want to do that? You know, why would we have this asynchronous communication? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah it just seemed like a strange thing to do. You know, sure, we've got the telephone. Sure. Why? Why do you need to? Right. <laughs> but. But now I see the appeal. Yeah, absolutely. What, well, I one of my kids that. was very big into texting. An adult kid, mm -hmm. uh, very much into texting, and uh, so got into texting with him, and then it kind of expanded. Yes. Expanded. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Now you make a, a distinction. Well, you you say that social anxiety is not introversion. You know, we were talking about shyness earlier. Right. And so we might say, well, shy people are introverted. Um, talk to us about why it's not introversion. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, a, a question I get all the time is how do I know if I have social anxiety or if I'm just an introvert? And so I like to distinguish it by saying that introversion is your way but social anxiety gets in your way. So we often think that uh, social anxiety is just a more extreme form of introversion, but I like to say that instead of being like tomato, tomato, they're more like apple and orange because introversion, so is, introversion is a personality trait and it's an introversion and extroversion are about where you get your energy. So introverts generally recharge by being in blissful solitude, being like with a friend one-on-one, -on -one, being in small groups of people that they know well, Whereas extroverts have often never met a stranger, like they get their energy from people and from talking <laughs> yeah. to people. And I think there's a misconception that extroverts love like raging parties or huge crowds. I don't, I don't think it's that extreme. It's, it's simply that they get their, their energy from interacting with others, whereas introverts get their energy from, um, from kind of being more inward focused, like reading or deep conversations and that, you know, that hence the word. Um, but you can absolutely be a socially anxious extrovert. So uh, for instance, I was talking to a young man who is a 
a, a teacher and a stand-up comic. So he loves being in front of people. He loves, he's pulled to the microphone, but he is always afraid that his audience is judging him and doesn't really want him there. And so it's, it's this, he's between this rock and a hard place because he gets his energy from people, but he is sort of afraid of them. So if he oh. avoids people, he ends up feeling sluggish and bored. But if he is with people, he ends up feeling judged. So it is uniquely difficult to be a socially anxious extrovert. Um, yeah, then, you know, I suffered, for, uh, my major career was uh, university teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suffered from anxiety dreams for, you know, that I think I probably suffered from anxiety dreams as a student too, around test sure. taking, but oh, sure. that was then got translated into teaching. And so there was the paradox of, and you talk about structure and the importance of structure mm. in the book. Uh, when I was in the structured role, yes, I'm the teacher here. Um, one would not know that I suffered from anxiety. Right. Uh, and, and once I got rolling, I d actually did not experience any anxiety. But then right. I would keep having these horrible nightmares, which would indicate that, in fact, there was an underlying anxiety. Sure. That somehow sure. I was, you know, rising above for a little mm -hmm. while. Mm -hmm. I feel, feel very good in front of the class. Uh, but then having discharged that role might not be as easy to hang out. Uh, with students after class. Uh, right, right. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think, so with, with the class, because I've, I've experienced this too, is that when you have a role to play, like if I am, I don't know, supervising a group of, of therapists in training, or if I'm teaching a class, or I have some kind of mission, then it's, it's much easier because there, there's less uncertainty. I know what I'm supposed to do. I have a, yeah. I have a, a mission. And, um, and so in, in the book, I talk about creating that for yourself um, in, in situations that might be more unstructured. So for instance, like I do this with my department holiday party. I go in thinking, <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk to the department chair and my boss and the office manager, people I supervise and anything else is, is, is gravy. Um, but having a mission, like having an agenda is super helpful because then that reduces the uncertainty. Um, and so doctors, you know, Simon Thompson and Ron Rapay are some are Australian social anxiety researchers that are just amazing. And they did this really creative study that I, I love to talk about because they had, they had two groups of, of women. So, um, so one group was, uh, suffered from social anxiety and the other group was basically the opposite of that. They were the, they were women who were kind of more confidently chatty than average. And so one at a time, they, they sent these women into um, a waiting room for an experiment that, unbeknownst to them, began as soon as they entered the room. So they sat down, and then um, a, a research assistant, so like a, a confederate, came into the room and uh, posed as another research participant. And he said, I hope we don't have to wait too long, and, and just saw what, what conversation might ensue. And if conversation petered off or she didn't respond, every 30 seconds, he would offer another prompt. And this went on for five minutes. Okay, so you've got this five minute chunk of unstructured interaction. Okay, so after that, the researchers came in and said, thank you so much both for coming. We really appreciate it. Okay, let's start the experiment. I'd like you to pretend that you're at a party and get to know each other as well as you can in the next five minutes. And so now these women have an agenda. They, they have a mission. And then at the end of, of those five minutes, the, the, two, the two five minute chunks were, were compared um, for, for social skills, social competence. Now, in the first five minutes, this makes sense, the, the women with social anxiety scored quite a bit worse than the women who were, again, more chattily, you know, confident than usual. But in the structured five minutes, the two groups were almost neck and neck. And so that's pretty impressive that these, the women with social anxiety can really put down this very impressive showing if they have some structure and if they have a mission. So, so that's, that's some advice that I give in the book to, to give yourself an agenda in unstructured situations to, to make yourself 
feel better and, and create some more certainty. Yeah, social psychologists are so devious that way. I, I know, you know yes. <laughs> always designing these tricky experiments. That you have to debrief afterwards, yes, yes. Yeah, and another thing that that triggers for me is one thing that I have learned very late uh, about, say, dealing with my own social anxiety. If you're mm -hmm. in a professional organization of some sort, volunteer. Yes. You volunteer so for an funny. office. Yeah, nobody wants to lead really. Or there are a few <laughs> weird people that do intensely right, right. to hold those offices. But every organization has a lot of vacuum spots in it where they right. really could use a volunteer. Yeah. And so a, a few times now I've sort of done that and noticed wow, that's really powerful, you know. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. just step you forward and say hey i'll take on some of the work then you meet people you become seen and appreciated for whatever you can bring to it yes and you've got something to talk about <laughs> right right you have a reason to talk to everybody and what happens yeah. is that uh at least i've found that uh the the role the confidence you have from the role kind of bleeds over into your own personality and then your own mm -hmm. personality kind of bleeds over into the role so it's not as if it's not as if you're being fake you're not you know adopting some kind of um, you know, pretend persona or like, uh, you know, you're not sending out your representative into the world. You're, you're, you know, it actually, you, you and that role kind of become each other and then you can feel more comfortable just being, being yourself and not having to have that role, which is the ideal outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you notice sometimes when we're particularly anxious, we end up doing the very things that yes. would draw negative attention to our Yes. Yes, the safety behaviors, absolutely. So, yeah, no, there's, um, so safety behaviors, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, are, what's the word you're using? What behaviors? Safe, safety behaviors. So, um, so safety behaviors are behaviors that we do to, um, to kind of try to artificially tamp down our anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. And so, okay, for, so here, here's, a, here's a story that I think is illustrative. So in the book, um, I, there's a character uh, who, in, in, who is a real guy. Um, his name is Jia Zhang, and he uh, came to the United States from China when he was 16. And he had big dreams and, you know, wanted to be the next Bill Gates. And so when he um, was 30, he said, okay, it's now or never. And he quit his corporate job and founded a startup. And it was all he had hoped for. It was fast paced. It was creative. But as soon as they were, he had hired some employees, it was about to, you know, really take off his, his backer his funder pulled um and so he was left with like a number of employees and a family to support and he had no income so he desperately had to find more funding but he was you know kind of mildly not really traumatized but he was affected by this experience and so had a really hard time uh asking for more funding he was really afraid of being rejected so what he decided to do was to put himself through kind of a boot camp uh, that he called 100 Days of Rejection, where he <laughs> tried to get rejected for 100 days in a row. And the first two days of his experience, I think, show a real difference. So um, on the, in the first day, he decided to ask the security guard in his office building if he could borrow $100. And so he, he, he films this on his phone. Like, he, he puts his phone in his pocket and, like, and has it filming as he, as he does this. And so in the, in the movie, you see him, um, like, a, he, he approaches this, the security guard, like, really quickly, he kind of scurries in and just, like, blurts out, hi, can I, can I borrow $100 from you? Like, really quickly. And the security guard, you know, looks puzzled and says, no, but then says, why? And, but all, all Ja hears is the no. And he says, oh, no, okay, all right, got, bye, thanks, bye. And he scurries away. And so there, his safety behavior is speed. He's trying to get this over with so he can stop feeling so anxious. Uh -huh. And so, so, and, but it's not, he, he realizes um, after the fact that, you know, the, the security guard said no, which in trying to get rejected, this was actually a success. But he also said why, which is, which is an invitation to extend the conversation. Like Ja could have talked with him more and, and maybe revealed, well, I'm, I'm trying to overcome rejection. So I'm forcing myself to make absurd requests or, you know, I don't know, this, there, there could have been other ways to handle it. So then the next day he says, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this differently. So he goes to 
a, a burger joint for lunch. And as he's, um, so he finishes his burger and then he sees a sign on the, on the soda fountain that says free refills. And he gets this idea. So he goes up to the counter and says, hi, I really enjoyed my bacon cheeseburger. Can I get a burger refill? <laughs> and the, the guy, the guy who's helping said, um, he doesn't really understand. So it takes him back and forth. But, but in the video, it's, it's striking because Jaw's tone of voice is calm and totally reasonable. And he's speaking at a reasonable speed. And, uh, you know, in, in his description, he says, you know, I stand with my shoulders square. I look the guy in the eye. And so he's, he's dropped the safety behavior of speed as well as and a number of other safety behaviors that he could possibly use, like maybe avoiding eye contact or speaking very softly or apologizing excessively. Um, and instead just asks as if this was a totally reasonable request. And by doing that, he still gets a rejection, but the guy's very respectful and you know, responds almost as if this is a reasonable request. And so, you know, Ja gets his rejection and then says, oh, thanks. Thanks very much. And I, you know, I, I'd like this place even more if you gave burger refills and just saunters away. And so he realizes that by dropping his safety behaviors, he not only appears more confident to others, which creates a feedback loop. So then, you know, other people treat him with, with respect, but it also creates this feedback loop within himself where if he carries himself and presents himself as confident, he actually feels more confident. It's kind of the same thing like how power posing works. If you, you, know, you stand like yeah. Superwoman and, or Wonder Woman, excuse me, and uh, you, you feel more confident. So yeah. he drops his safety behaviors and, uh, and feels better. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good story. You know, your story about Ja uh, reminds me of the phrase, uh, fake it until you make it. It's so true. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. It's uh, it's it's going through the motions um, until your confidence catches up. Yeah, you you fault perfectionism mm -hmm. as uh, part of the problem. Tell us about that. Our own sure. perfectionistic uh, tendencies. Ab yeah, absolutely. So so perfectionism is a big driver of social anxiety, and perfectionism is actually a little bit of a misnomer because it's not really about wanting to be perfect, it's, it's the sense of never being good enough. Mm. And so we, we put so much pressure on ourselves uh, to be smart or funny or interesting or cool, which actually trips us up because perfectionism is all or nothing. We think that unless we give some kind of stellar performance or unless we drop this perfectly timed witty comment in the conversation or, you know, hold forth, like this, give this this perfect monologue in a, in, a, in a meeting at work, unless we do that, we are an abject failure. And so the answer there is to lower the bar. It's to, you know, to learn that you know, your social life isn't like a laser maze. Like if you wake, make one mistake, alarms are not gonna go off all around you. <laughs> um, and that it's okay to not to speak in perfectly smooth, articulate sentences. It's okay to have an awkward silence or two. And so, the phrase I use in the book is to, I, 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 I credit David Burns, um, you know, author of, uh, of Feeling Good. Um, uh, I use his phrase, dare to be average. And, uh, and so I think that that can be very helpful in helping uh, you relax and just be yourself. I think you actually cite Albert Ellis uh, someplace in your book. And uh, uh, which I remember because people don't seem to cite him much anymore. Sure, but, sure. But he would he would say, you know, how, how terrible would it be, you know, if right. such, and such happened? You know? Right, right. Would he it, would say, like, would well, it, will you die? Like, is this irreversible? You know, and uh, right. so you know, yeah, he he was very good at um, at, at decatastrophizing. So there's yes. a, I guess there's a, there's a story that I I heard him tell himself on public radio. Um, that, that stuck with me where he said when he was a young man of 19, he, uh, he was scared of women, basically. And so he took himself to um, what was then called the, the Bronx Botanic Gardens, now the New York Botanic Gardens. And he took it upon himself to, to try to talk to as many women as possible. So he would just sit down on the park bench with them and say, hi, you know, how, how's it going? And he discovered that nothing happens that, you know, that nobody, you know, bit him, nobody like insulted him, like, and even if he doesn't get anywhere. 
um, it's still a pleasant conversation. And he said, mm -hmm. I, I saw that, um, that, you know, nothing catastrophic occurs and that I didn't have anything to be afraid of. So that, that's very powerful. Yeah, he even went on to uh, write uh, books about uh, how to how to date people, and uh, you know. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. He had a very interesting career. He he was yeah. he did all sorts of things. So yeah. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, he's one of the early pillars of the behaviorist approach. Yes, uh, absolutely. Of CBT. Yes. Uh, so how what's your recommendation for how people can gain more confidence i'm i was also thinking of peter sellers and and uh, and uh, inspector clouseau sure. who, who is the harder he tries to to be uh on track the more he kind of screws things up right right um yeah. so i in order to build more confidence i think so um one of the people i interviewed for the Book was um, Dr. Richard Heinberg, who's kind of the, the father of social anxiety research. He's at, at Temple University. And uh, I asked him, like, what, what is the secret? Like, what, if you could give one piece of advice for overcoming social anxiety, what would it be? And he said, go forth and do. And, and I think that's, that's, really, that's really true. Like I talked about before, a lot of my clients wish they could kind of, you know, hit pause on the world and make themselves feel better and then, you know, hit play again and, and go off. and and uh, go into the world. But in fact, um, doing the very things you're afraid of, you know, not, not, not way out of your comfort zone, but maybe like a, 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 a little reach out of, <coughs> excuse me, out of your comfort zone is exactly where the learning occurs. And so when we feel that urge to avoid, or we feel that urge to conceal or hide, I think it's important to, 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 to use that as a cue and to therefore then try to do that thing, to drop mm -hmm. our safety behaviors, to act as if we're confident, and, and to learn the lessons that we otherwise would not have learned had we avoided uh, yeah. whatever that is. So. Is there something about how our brains are wired that we have this tendency to go towards things like social anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I mean, insecurity is part of the human condition. Like it's, it's universal. And I think, I mean, I, I, this is all just kind of professional speculation on my part, but I think that we are wired to be um, a little bit insecure in order to force introspection, that we doubt ourselves in order to check ourselves and to, to see that we are it, it, it sparks growth. It's, it makes us get along with our fellow humans. And, and I think that, that a little bit of insecurity generally helps us keep um, group harmony. And, uh, and so, so I think that's, that's part of why um, we can all relate to feeling insecure. There's definitely a genetic component. Um, if you have a first degree relative, so a parent, a child, a sibling with an anxiety disorder, you have a four to six fold increased risk of having that same disorder. Hmm. Um, it's, it's unclear if anxiety um, is the, I mean, because, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that anxiety is genetic, but you can't look down a microscope and see anxiety. It's not objective. It's all self-report. And so the genetics are still kind of muddy. It's unclear if it's the large effects of some genes, the small effects of many genes. There's this problem called phenotypic complexity, which means that um, that anxiety, like a genetic predisposition to being anxious could manifest in a lot of different ways. It can manifest as social anxiety, but it can manifest as OCD or panic or whatever. And so, and there's also this like impossible to separate like what I call the coffee and cream swirl of genetics mm -hmm. and experience that we might be predisposed to be anxious, but if we're raised in such a way that we uh, don't get to avoid as much, then we're going to turn out very different than if we have that same predisposition, but we we do avoid and don't don't get to experience don't get to build the evidence that we can handle things and don't get to experience that the worst case scenario often doesn't happen. So like my my husband for example um, was is uh, to, he he says and I didn't know him when he was this old but he said he was basically afraid of everything until he was twelve, um, but he he grew up in this household where that was very friendly very social. And um, he thought it was mandatory to invite the plumber or the electrician or the roofers to stay for dinner. 
And so he, you know, he can talk to everybody and uh, certainly, you know, does, does not need this book. Um, but that's, you know, that's because of his, his experience growing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mindfulness these days seems to be offered as a panacea for nearly everything. It's, it's very, yeah, the, the people who specialize in, uh, in mindfulness will bemoan that it's, it's, it's become trendy. It's like a, it's a buzzword. Now. Yeah, 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 and yet you and also yet, say mindfulness I do. can help alleviate social anxiety. So, sure. w- why is that? Yeah, well, I think um, I think so. Okay, so mindfulness is is about taking a step back and being able to see something for 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 what it is. It's so if you ask John Kabat-Zinn, so mindfulness is paying attention on purpose in the present moment without judgment. And so if, and so to, and in, in mindfulness meditation, you need an object. So that could be your body. You could do a body scan. That could be your breath, but it could also be your thoughts. And so I think get, taking a step back and realizing that the thoughts going through your head are just thoughts, are, are, are the kind of the yammerings of this inner critic and are not necessarily true, can be very powerful. So, so being able to be mindful of, of what's going through your mind rather than just taking it as truth, taking that inner critics, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, criticisms as, as truth. Um, yeah. can be uh, also powerful. the without judgment, that to me seems yes. to be really yes. key. Yes. Is to, yeah. And um, so the title of your book is, uh, is How to Be Yourself. Mm-hmm. And paradoxically, you say that if you tell someone, just be yourself, Oh, it's That's so annoying. Terrible advice. <laughs> it's terrible advice. That? Well, because it implies that they hadn't thought of that. It implies like, oh, it's kind of insulting because like, oh, is that all I have to do? Oh, geez, well, <laughs> why didn't I just do that? No, I don't have to feel this anxious. Um, yeah. So you know, it's it's certainly it's 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 terrible advice, and at the same time, it's brilliant advice because well, so at least the way I define it, um, your yourself being your true self is being the self you are without fear, and I think we can all relate to how we feel when we are with a trusted group, when we're with our partner, when we're with a best friend, then, there, then there's not that inhibition that gets in the way. And so we, we know who we are as our true selves. And certainly that, that can be variable. Like we're, we're a different self at work than we are, you know, with our grandma, than we are hanging out with our best buddies. Um, but, the, but the self we are without fear is in my estimation, the true self. And so that yeah. is what we're trying to get at. And so yeah. you know, by using tools like dropping safety behaviors or giving yourself um, a role or something I haven't talked about yet, which is turning your attention inside out, all those things can, can help you feel less fearful and more like your true self. What do you mean turning your attention inside out? Sure. So, um, so when we feel self-conscious, uh, our attention often just just turns inward and so for instance we if we're in a socially anxious moment if we're having a conversation with somebody we we start to self-monitor and we think oh i hope I, is is what i said did, was what i just said did that does that sound stupid do i look like an idiot um oh he just shifted in his seat does that mean that he's bored um i hope they don't see me sweating i hope i hope there's not like a spots under my arms i hope they don't see me trembling and so there's all this self uh, monitoring and and self focused attention that's that's happening. And what that does is it takes up all our bandwidth, and it leaves very little left over to see actually how the conversation is actually going. You know, our, our inner critic is telling us it's going horribly. Um, but also there's just, there's very little attention left to to kind of manage just the ins and outs of conversation. And that's why we trip over our own feet or spill our drink onto somebody. Because just all our all our bandwidth is taken up. So, if we turn our attention outward, essentially, if we focus on anything except ourselves, so we look at the person we're talking to, we listen closely to what they're saying, we attune to the outside environment, then that frees up a lot of that bandwidth, and we can respond more spontaneously in the moment. We can, if we're actually listening, then rather than you know doing this very tight impression management of thinking like, okay, what, what am I going to say next? And does that sound intelligent enough? Um, you can, we can just respond in, in the moment with, with our natural interest and curiosity. 
and more authenticity. And what uh, researchers have found is that when we, when we do uh, let our authentic self um, be present, that people like us more, they would prefer to be our friend, and we, and we just generally come across as more, more authentic and more likable. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's counterintuitive because we do all this impression management to try to be likable, but really people like us more if we just let all that go. Yeah, there's uh, something that you say that I found terribly reassuring, uh, that uh, basically that we socially anxious people are actually wonderful people. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, social anxiety, you know, comes as a package deal. And, and so people with social anxiety, you know, research has found, and just in my own practice, I have discovered that, um, that folks with social anxiety are often quite conscientious, we're hard workers, we have high standards and we do well, we're good listeners, we're pro-social, meaning we, you know, we, we care about other people and we're thoughtful. Um, and so, I, and I also think it's really important to mention that those things don't go away as we work on our own social anxiety. So as our, as our anxiety decreases, all those wonderful qualities that are really important to getting along with our fellow humans, especially you know, in this 21st century, increasingly diverse, globalized world, um, all, all those positive things are not going to decline, <coughs> excuse me, along with our anxiety. Yeah, and a kind of a surprising bottom line to the book, to me, uh, is kindness. Mm, you, mm -hmm. you kind of underscore kindness, and you wouldn't think that, okay, I'm going to read this book about social anxiety and how it's going to help me get over that, and then towards the end, boom, we're into kindness. <laughs> sure. I, well, because I think, you know, folks with social anxiety are often concerned about coming across as competent. I think, I think the perfectionism drives a lot of wanting to be seen as, you know, knowing what we're doing or intelligent or, you know, otherwise competent. And really, that's not what people are looking for in a friend. What they're looking for is kindness and warmth and trustworthiness and all those things that help us connect with others. And so I think we can, um, we can stop worrying about whether how we're coming across in terms of are we being impressive and instead think about am I connecting? Am I, am I listening? Am I revealing a little bit about myself? You know, folks with social anxiety are often quite reticent and uh, reluctant to, to reveal little bits of themselves, but that's how you get closer to somebody. There's a, um, that disclosure should be gradual and reciprocal, and that's how intimacy mm -hmm is built. So, yeah. so kindness and, you know, just telling people about ourselves and what we think and do and feel is the way to connect with others. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like we've kind of done it in terms of uh, covering the book. I sure. hope feel that way too. And uh, I, I wanted to let people know that you're a podcaster as well. I, was, I am, yeah. You know, um, I, I didn't know that when I, when I went into this. And sure. And then I discovered that you've got a podcast. Tell us about that. Sure. So it's called Savvy Psychologist, and I've been doing it for, gosh, I think almost four years now, which now that I say that is, is just mind-blowing to me. But um, yeah, I'm almost at episode 200, so not, not nearly as, as, as far as, as you've gotten. Uh, I, I aspire, quickly, <laughs> I aspire to, to your numbers. Um, but it's, uh, so it's, um, it's a mental health and wellness podcast, and the, my tagline is, um, evidence-based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. And I really try to make um, whatever the topic is uh, actionable and clear and to give um, specific tips and tools in each episode. And incidentally, it's a very short podcast. It's only about you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So it's, uh, it's easy to listen to on the go or if you only have a few minutes. So it's, yeah. it's been a joy to do and I, I love doing it. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, anything more that you want to say as we wrap this up here? No, I, I, I've been delighted to talk with you. This has been really, really fun. Okay, for me too, for me too. Fantastic. So, uh, Ellen Hendrickson, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much. I've, I've had a lot of fun. <laughs>